Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. On the 1st of March 1881, the Russian Tsar Alexander II was travelling through the snow to the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. An armed Cossack sat with the coach driver. Another six Cossacks followed on horseback and behind them came a group of police officers in sledges. It was a day that the Tsar, known for his liberal reforms, had signed a document granting the first ever constitution to the Russian people. But his journey was being watched by a group of radicals called Narodnia Volaya, or the People's Will. On a street corner near the Catherine Canal, they hurled the first of their bombs to halt the Tsar's ironclad coach. When Alexander ignored advice and ventured out into the snow to comfort his dying Cossacks, he was killed by another bomber who took his own life in the blast. But why did they kill the reforming Tsar? What was the political climate that inspired such extreme acts? And could March 1881 have been the moment that the Russian state started an inexorable march towards revolution? With me to discuss the assassination of Tsar Alexander II is Orlando Figes, Professor of History at Birkbeck College, University of London, Katriona Kelly, Professor in Russian at Oxford University, and Dominic Levine, Professor of Russian Government at the London School of Economics. Orlando, he was famous, Tsar Alexander II was famous for his emancipation of the serfs, he was even given the title Tsar Liberator. The root of his uh, feeling for the necessity for reform can go back to the Crimean War. Can you tell us why that had such an impact on him and what impact it had on Russia? Uh, Well, the war was a huge shock for Russia, having gone into it full of optimism that Slavophilism uh, would prevail over Western powers in the crisis of the Middle East. And the army had been shown up very badly and um, the, the navy had been practically destroyed. And there was a general feeling... Um, in 1855-56, as the war came to a close, that a modern state was needed, that it couldn't go on being uh, an economy run on the basis of serf labour, that a a modern army was needed, reform of the government was needed. And uh, this had been a sense within the bureaucracy for some time. And I think Alexander, not being by disposition a reformer or a liberal, although he had some liberal upbringing as a child, Um, was a European statesman in the sense that he could see the need for reform and began to bring that into being. You've alluded to the state of Russia by alluding to the serfs in those opening remarks. Generally speaking, what was the state of Russia in the 1850s when it came out of the war, a defeated empire, Mm. having built itself up as a great imperial power and, in fact, surged towards the West and so on? What was the state of Russia, in broad stroke terms, obviously? Heavily indebted in terms of uh, the serfs. Most of the serfs were, in fact, mortgaged out to state and noble banks by the by the landowners, which is one of the reasons why the government was able to force through the emancipation in order to clear the debts of the gentry. Um, so there was a general sense that actually, you know, the serf economy was not going to take Russia any further. Uh, You're talking about the serfs, about mm. a third of the population, as I understand it. Well, considerably more. Really? Uh, the peasantry, which probably re- represented 80% of the population, was mainly serf. There were other types of peasant, crown peasants, state peasants, which were legally tied to the state. But the serfs were, were the majority of the peasants, and they were tied to the land through the commune, and they came with the land as part of the landowner's fiefdom, estate, and the landowner had judicial power, administrative power in the locality, and owned the serfs much as a slave owner might own a slave, except in Russia, of course, the slaves also pay taxes. So the army was based on serf uh, conscription, um, and uh, many of the serfs had gone into the Crimean War on the hope, at least, um, and certainly informed by rumours, that they would get their liberation by fighting. So there was a huge expectation at all levels of society that the, the defeat would lead to some form of reform. So we have a massive area of land, a backward agrarian society, little if any industrialisation in the mid-19th century. Can we come, Dominic Levin, can we come to Alexander II's most famous reform, which was the emancipation of the serfs in 1861? So he got on with it very quickly after the war. Uh, What risks was he taking and what did that entail? Any government which tries to change the basic system of property owning throughout an entire country is taking risks. It's taking risks in terms of making itself deeply unpopular with the people whose property it's expropriating, particularly since that's the, the dominant class, the landowning gentry. Can I just pause for one second? Just, we just have to get it absolutely clear to our listeners that the serfs were property. Uh, so when we were talking about property owning, the 
property that these landowners owned was land, forests, lakes, but also serfs. Yes, and the emancipation expropriates both their property and labour, without which the land is, to a great extent, valueless, but also part of their land. So by the standards of uh, Victorian Europe, this is a rather extreme you know, thing to do. Beyond that, the state is, is scared of bankruptcy, because somewhere along the line... Uh, a financial system which has already been gutted by the costs of the Crimean War is supposed to cover the costs or somehow manage the costs of expropriating the basic system of, of wealth in the country. So you've got two immediate problems and then you've got a real fear that since serfdom is the effective system of government for half the, you know, the peasant population, once you abolish it, um, what is going to happen? Who's going to provide you know, for order? And how are you going to actually persuade a lot of former serfs for whom liberation was supposed to be some kind of opening to a far better life that, you know, all the inevitable compromises involved in in this reform are acceptable? So there are a whole range of of fears and dangers. What state was the Tsar and his uh, administration in to bring this about? Well, they were in a state, or the Tsar himself was in a state of Desperation would be putting it too strongly, but after all, the whole principle of the the Tsarist state was that it existed to make Russia a great power, competitive with the other European great powers. And ever since 1812, when they defeated Napoleon, the theory was that Russia was the greatest power in continental Europe. They'd just been defeated on their own territory by relatively small numbers of British and French soldiers. Uh, And quite clearly, um, the state was simply not in a position to compete internationally. Uh, you know, the Tsar was getting information about what was going in, on in the Crimea via Paris, um, because it was going out to Paris by telegraph. It took less time for British and French reinforcements to reach the Crimea from Western Europe than it did for Russian <coughs> reinforcements to come down from Moscow. That's because one side's fighting and moving with, uh, communicating with uh, the technology of the Industrial Revolution, and the other is still, Russia is still in the pre-industrial age. Well, you don't need to be a genius to realise that you're not going to survive long if this goes on. He not only tackled the serfs, which is the biggest thing, uh, but he moved in to try to tackle the military and the judiciary, didn't he? Can you give us some idea of that? There was a a very fundamental set of reforms across the board. They didn't all come at the same time. Uh, Once you destroy serfdom, you almost have to completely reform local government because local government is, to a great extent, connected to the, you know, the system of, of serfdom. On top of that, I mean, if your main aim is to, to modernise, and that means modernising the economy as much as anything else, quite clearly um, the first thing that occurs to a mid-Victorian statesman is that you need an effective system of civil law so that you can enforce contracts, so that you can protect property in the modern age. So probably the most radical of all the changes is in fact the, the judicial reform of 1864, The main military reform comes later, comes after they've seen Prussia defeat first Austria and then France in 1866 to 71, when it becomes clear that you need a mass conscript army with a, you know, short service uh, soldiers who will then go into a reserve, because the situation in the Crimea in military terms was catastrophic. You know, Russia runs out of troops um, because there are no reserves. The army, when which goes into the Crimean War, is the old long service army. The soldiers serve for 25 years, um, and it's a complete separate caste. Well, the soldiers die off in droves. In any event, they're deployed around the entire circumference of the empire. You have to realise that most of the army never gets anywhere near Crimea. It's either in Poland or it's on the Baltic. Um, So there is an absolute pressing need for military reform, but that itself has dramatic, you know, broader social consequences. Again, setting out the broad uh, scene here, Catriona, before we move on to, to Alexander II more particularly, what effect did these changes that have been raised by Orlando and by Devlin have on Russian society in the short term? What, how did Russian society act in the 1860s, 1870s, to this assault on the serfs, and on the position of the serfs and on the uh, judiciary and the military? Well, it depends which part of society you're talking about, the part that's most familiar to Westerners, so the works of great writers, I mean, novels by Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. I mean, I think to begin with, they probably have been written whatever the conditions... I mean, even if they'd been written for for what in Russian is called the desk drawer, in other words, without thought of publication. So they were helped to the public domain quickly by the fact that there'd been censorship reform in 1865 
um, which means that writers can write, as it were, what they want for publication with less, less fear of what's going to go on. But it has to be said that the majority of great writers at this period actually aren't particularly pro-reformist. They're more, more anxious about the way that the reforms are going to affect the society and one can see that for example in crime and punishment which is about how a member of the younger generation has got these terrible ideas about um, the admissibility of murder you can see it also in fathers and sons which is about um, somebody who came to be called not by Turgenev but by by his readers a nihilist so about the sort of um, the mood of um, negation and materialism that's sweeping through society Um, and then there is of course a quite strong body of opinion uh, and quite influential opinion that's strongly nationalist. I mean, the sort of the, uh, what one might call the, the tail end of the Slavophile movement, so the people who had been um, the first generation of um, what one might call nationalists with a historical um, perspective, so people who looked back to Russia before Peter the Great and saw that as, as, as being the path that Russia should have been on and had, de- and had deviated from. Um, would it be fair to say, then, in the 1860s and early 70s, that, that as a result of the, of the fallout from the war and what ex- Alexander was trying to do, uh, and the result of ideas did I, uh, coming in from the West, there was a, a, a great uh, blooming or outburst of new groups, new ideas, various forms of radicalism going through Russia at the time? That's certainly true. I and mean, that you can see, for example, in the strength of the feminist movement in Russia at this period. And, I mean, there's a connection of of that with the revolutionary movement. I mean, it's not at all a coincidence that some of the most fervent revolutionaries were women, and they were women who'd trained in universities. I mean, not, not inside Russia, because Russian universities weren't open to women, but who'd gone, gone abroad and, and, and trained there. Um, and then, I mean, it's also a period when women writers are publishing in large quantities in, in the main literary journals. There's a lot of talk about women's education. People are setting up university-level courses for women, for example. Um, and, yes, there's a great deal of debate on reform, but not all of it reaches the public domain by any means. Well, Anna Fajas, is there a sort of contradiction growing then at the time between the increasing uh, uh, desire to, be, to take things from the West, uh, to take the best from the West, the things they didn't like about the West, but to take the best from the West, particularly in ideas, on the one hand, as it were, at the Western side of the country almost, and, uh, and the great uh, Slavophile, uh, pre-Peter the Great, idealised uh, peasantry, serfdom, which had its own movement growing. Is there a, are there contradictions here? Are they fertile or what's going on? Yeah, yeah, there's a chance because, as Dominic says, the, the, the main challenge confronting society post-1861 is how to integrate the peasant as a citizen into local government, um, how to recognise the peasant as a fellow Russian. And so um, the sort of literature that Cassione has mentioned is almost obsessed, really, by the peasant question, the question, the question of how, what is Russia going to be, how are we going the to... The soul of Russia. Yeah, the soul right. of Russia. What, 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 who are these peasants? Um, uh, how are we going to uh, find a common nationhood with them? Um, and uh, so, so that, that, that really becomes the central issue uh, for the whole of educated society. And I think there's a sense also that 1861 is the birth of a new society, that this is a new Russia... Uh, this negation of the old Russia, of the, of the, of the Russia of serfdom, um, is very strong, particularly among, about, among the, you know, youth group students who are coming through the universities, influenced by Western ideas, and confronting the peasant question as, as a question of, you know, who are we going to be as a nation? How are we going to reform ourselves as a society based on ideals of liberty and justice? Um, so that, that contradiction, in, in a sense... The contradiction between Westernism and Slavophilism is, is has run its course by 1861, because everyone now agrees essentially that yes, Russia has to base itself on Western technology, has to become a modern society. The Crimean War has has, has consolidated that truth, uh, but it's going, now going to be a question of how do we marry uh, peasant traditions? How do we marry our native customs? How do we integrate the peasant who's yet to be educated and brought up to the level of Western technology into a society which can be based upon the rule of law um, uh, and universal values? I know it's, always, it's, it's a fatal question to ask a historian about when anything new began, 
because uh, we trace back several centuries. But nevertheless, could it be proposed as a conversational generalization that in the 1860s there, were a new, there was a new force of radicalism, a new sorts of people being educated or in numbers or in where they came from, and, uh, and they were beginning to drive the thinking of, of Russia in a way that, say, the Decembrists hadn't done in the 1820s? I think, firstly, you've got the issue of new ideas and the legitimacy of the old setup, the Nicholas setup, being smashed by the Crimean War. And then, not, I think, immediately in large numbers, but soon after, yes, you do have um, all sorts of new people coming through. <clears throat> you shouldn't also forget the fact that some of these so-called new people are dispossessed sons and daughters of the gentry. Are they, are they called the Raznochinsky? Raznochinsky, that just means people of different, um, different social classes, groups, you know. Mm. Whereas the old Russian setup has, has got people typecast in legally defined social estates. So you've got all sorts of people floating around, sons of priests, daughters of um, chemists, new sort of middle class, spin-offs of bankrupt gentry, all sorts of things. But you sh it's not just the social issue, it's there's a really new intellectual current running through linked in part to the expectations which had been raised and then in certain cases not met by the emancipation, and linked also, of course, to the influence of similar ideas passing through Europe at that time. Can we just uh, dwell for a moment on what these people were coming to the cities, uh, as I understand it, they were forming groups. You, you have in the city, I'm trying to just get the real context for so the assassination of Alexander uh, fits into place of uh, a society which... In, in general terms, he has tried to reform radically with the serfs, and as you indicated, with the judiciary and the military, in very substantially. He also looked at the universities. Uh, in some ways, he can't meet, meet his own demands because of the inadequacy of his own system, but he's tried to do that, and he's created a force. Uh, would you admit that this is a force that has not been there before? The force might be the number of groups, but it is still an intellectual force for change, agitating. I think the key is that it's a force outside the state system. Um, you know, these people's grandfathers uh, had, if they had had these ideas, worked within the state system. Um, now, as the society is growing and there are a larger number of people who are educated and at the same time they're more footloose because they may not have an income any longer if they're the mm. you know, children of the gentry, um, you've actually got a more complicated relationship between state and society. Uh, and that is something that, you know, Alexander is forced to have to come to terms with and in the end, of course, kills him. Yeah. And it's yeah. a generational thing too, isn't it? I mean, that's why again, of course, it fathers and sons because you do have a conflict really between the liberal men of the 1840s who would be the men of 1864, very you know European in their ambitions for Russia, um, very liberal in their outlook about how you reform provincial Russia, um, and um, a younger generation who've come through the universities who who don't necessarily think in terms of running the estate in the way that their father's generation would have done, who are looking to become involved in the professions or mm -hmm. who are taking up the pen and writing for local newspapers or whatever, and who um, are influenced by radical ideas. Um, and in a way, coming back to a point you were making earlier, a question you were asking earlier about Russia and the West, I think... The, this nihilistic strand that's coming through in intellectual terms in the 1860s is something rather foreign to European traditions of radical thought. It's something quite, not just revolutionary, but almost millenarian, really, in its connotations and, and significance in the 1860s, because it's returning to the, or picking up again the, the idea of negating the whole of official Russia, the Russia of our fathers, the, uh, the Russia that is still, despite the emancipation of the serfs, based on huge injustice and we have a great debt to, our, to, to, to the people, the serfs, and so on. Katya, and are we seeing in the great literature of the 60s and 70s, are we seeing these ideas carried out inside the novels, inside the literature? And is that part of the... Do the writers see this as part of their purpose, to portray and move on the society? Well, I suppose, I mean, I'm essentially a literary snob, so I'd have to say within great literature, no, but within the literature of the period, without any doubt. So there is what is, for my money, a truly awful novel called What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, which is one of the most influential books. I mean, a, a life guide for young people in this generation and later generations, um, sort of right through to the Soviet period where it was taught as a set text in schools, which is about... I mean, it's essentially about a menage à trois where the husband 
um, nobly stands aside in order to let the other man take his place and there's no kind of quarrelling or anything nasty like that. But the influential parts of it are not just to do with that, but also a sewing commune of ex-prostitutes is founded. I mean, it's about creating a utopia in the society that you live in. Um, and, I mean, its tone is much gentler than... Is that, that's the interesting paradox that Bazarov, the hero of Fathers and Sons, is sort of storms into the drawing room and offends everybody. And what is to be done is really much more about cooperation and harmony. Um, perhaps that's why it's so deeply unsatisfactory <laughs> to literary specialists. But um, anyway, it was, as I say, very, very widely read and, and, and loved. And very influential precisely because yeah. it was telling people how they should live. Exactly. And it was also a... Um, a complete negation of of existing Russia. I mean, it was the idea that this is going to be... We're going to set up a totally new Russia. We're going to find brotherhood among ourselves and we're going to live like peasants in an egalitarian way. And so this is already, you know, Western ideas of, of liberty, equality and justice have suddenly become a very revolutionary... Uh, tool in the hands of student uh, uh, Russian youth. Can we just briefly go to the the, uh, to the, the, uh, the very public representation of the, as it were, the West Slav connection, this uh, the to the people movement uh, in the 1870s? Can you tell us what that was and how far it, uh, what its limitations were? Essentially, it's a, a relatively small group numbered in sort of low thousands uh, of educated. You could call them Raznachintsi, sometimes children of the gentry, sometimes of what you might call middle class, who decide to establish a link with the people, which in those days means the peasantry, going out to the villages, partly to serve the people and partly to mobilise the people against the state in some kind of revolutionary movement. Uh, there's, of course, vast disillusionment because these urban types, young people going out to the villages, firstly find that it's immensely difficult to actually acquire the trust of the peasantry, um, and secondly, that uh, sometimes these peasants aren't actually quite what they'd expected. And then there's also the Tsarist police to cope with. Uh, so the movement of the people is, uh, in a sense, a flop, though rather a spectacular one. It does bring out in part, though, one element of this counterculture, which Orlando's talking about, and Catriona, in the sense that these younger people, having divorced themselves from their own families and from you know, really the society in which they live. Create an alternative society with a completely alternative set of values. They dress differently. And part of the desperation is that having cut themselves off, they're trying to find a new purpose for their existence. And this linking up with the people, serving the people, is a sort of substitute for religion in some ways, which helps to explain the extra desperation when those who you're serving don't seem to be interested. The censorship slightly changes, and the uh, 1872 Das Kapital, Marx's Das Kapital, is allowed in and translated, mm. and in terms of that sort of book, uh, enjoys a considerable success in Russia. Do you think that had any impact? Were, 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 well, it obviously had impact on people read it. Can you tell us what sort of impact it had? It had enormous impact. Um, as you say, it came in by almost by default. The, the censors thought it was such a sort of so academic dull, yeah. book <laughs> that no one would understand it or take any lessons from it, and so it could <coughs> quite easily. Although the censors then got wind of it and, and, and punished the, the publisher Nikolai Polyakov by, I think, banning an edition of Diderot or something that he brought out the <laughs> next year. But um, it had enormous influence. I think mainly because until that point, uh, Russian radical movements only had a sort of um, uh, uh, homegrown Jacobinism to go on, uh, a nihilism that they constructed themselves. And suddenly they received from Europe uh, the commandments of what it meant to be a proper socialist. And it was scientific. So they, they felt suddenly they had history on their side and they had Europe on their side and that there was salvation for Russia because it could not any more avoid the march of capitalism, so that even if the peasants, as Dominic says, uh, were slightly reluctant to join the students in rising up against the Tsar in the going to the people movement, nevertheless, in the long run, social forces would inevitably bring about uh, contradictions in society leading to the rise of a revolutionary force that could be built on. Um, 
Um, so, uh, it, it, and the impact as a result was just as, I mean, we often sort of try to divide as historians the populists from the Marxists and look at two different strands. And I don't think we should do that, really, because, in fact, Marxism was just as influential on the populists and on the People's Will, which was the assassination group that saw off Alexander II, as it was on on the social democratic or Marxist movement itself. Now, we're going to turn to the assassination. Before we do, can I make a, perhaps a last attempt, Katrina, to bring literature to bear on this? You, you, you've said that the only literature that was any, of any influence at all was literature sort of way below the salt. Um, nevertheless, in your early remarks, you did mention the appearance of uh, a certain radical persons in Dostoevsky, and wasn't Turgenev sympathetic to the radicals as well? Well, I don't think in Fathers and Sons. I mean, I, I, mean, I think he's... He managed to annoy everybody with that book. I mean, he annoyed conservatives. Yeah, but I, I, I don't want to push you, but was Tegadiev sympathetic? Or right? I mean, I want to know what's coming into force at this time. Uh, I think he was, if I may mm. say. I know you're the scholar. I right? think Virgin so, Soil is quite sympathetic Virgin to soil, those. Yeah, exactly. um, well, I suppose, yes, and, uh, and on the eve. Yes, mm. I mean, there is a sort of sense of... I, I think, actually, that on the whole, people are writing... Great writers writing from a relative conservative point of view, and I would include Turgenev in that because yeah, but I mean, relative conservatism in a in, in in a country that's been cemented in ultra conservatism can be a move towards yeah. liberalism. But Dostoevsky is more conservative than the state. Mm. Dostoevsky is more exactly. conservative than the Tsar. Um, but inside Dostoevsky, yeah. characters work their way, which can inflame uh, the lives of young persons reading about these characters. Yes, I, 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 it works the I, other I, way with Dostoevsky. Really? Um, you think yes. people read Dostoevsky say, "I'll never lift a bomb again." I think people read Dostoevsky and fear what godlessness will bring Russia to. Do you think 22-year-olds do that? A lot of them, yes. At that time? Yes, if they get to read Dostoevsky, uh, yes. yes. I would and disagree I, with that, actually. Cause I, I would disagree with both of you, because I think that both Turgenev, uh, although, although a liberal, and Dostoevsky, although in his life an arch-reactionary, still harboured sympathy, some sympathy for the idealism of, of people who went out, you know, got off their butts, didn't just read books, but went out there and did something to try and help Russia. And I think uh, that, you know, it, it, it gets transposed in, perhaps in Dostoevsky's case, into a sort of uh, sense of religious calling. Uh, I mean, uh, but, they're, they're, I, but I think Dostoevsky, nonetheless, would almost equate socialism and Christianity. I think there's a sort of struggle in later Dostoevsky to put those two together. So from that point of view, as well as in the later writings of Tigano, I think there is a sort of sympathy, which, in fact, echoes a sympathy in society as a whole. For, I mean, even within the, 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 uh, that, the, the administration itself, there are people who still sympathise with, with the revolutionary terrorists because they, they, they're seen to be fighting for a good cause. Well, I, I think this maybe is an oversimplification, and one has to remember that even some of the terrorists... I mean, um, Sofia Pirovska, who after, the, after Alexander II had been blown up, was reduced to floods of tears and saying, why did we do it? Why did we kill him? It's all right to do it when you blow him up, isn't it? <laughs> well, you could say that. But, I mean, but if I he was a terrorist and was part of the blowing up, it's kind of, you know, crocodile tears. I think what say. I'd say is there was a sort of general m messianic feeling in Russian society, a sort of sense that things needed to be changed, which in some Russians led them into revolutionary sympathies. And in Dostoevsky, for example, led him into a belief in Christian reform, which is what we see in Brothers Karamazov. Mm, one of the things you've got to note is that, yes, Dostoevsky is in certain sense socialist and in a complete sense very conservative and Christian. The one thing that he, as many, 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 many other Russians are, is anti-liberal. Um, mm. And the left and yes. the right are united mm. on that. Mm. Right, let's move to, the, uh, to this group, the uh, People's Will, um, who assassinated Alexander II. What was particularly distinctive briefly about them, Orlando? Um, the commitment to political revolution, I think. The, the, the going to the people movement was essentially a movement for social revolution. In, our, in other words, the idea that the way to reform Russia was by educating the people, uh, using propaganda, and raising their consciousness so that they would organise themselves, and therefore that would be a form of social revolution. Um, whereas, uh, out of frustration... Um, in the late 1870s, the People's Will emerged. It was formed in 1879 and was, from the very beginning, committed to political revolution. It was influenced by earlier Jacobin Russian thinkers like Sergei Nechayev and Pyotr Tukhachev, who had both argued for a coup d'etat in Russia. And uh, their executive committee, um, which was a tiny group of about a dozen people, um, uh, demanded from its followers... Uh, in the major cities of Russia, who amounted to no more than a couple of hundred, probably, 
absolute allegiance to the dictates of the executive committee, that they would be a revolutionary vanguard, and that they would essentially uh, overthrow the state and set up a revolutionary dictatorship as a means to social revolution. And use assassination if they had to. Yeah, the assassination is, in fact, the, the first point on their agenda. Um, between right. 1879 and 81, there are, I think, eight attempts on Alexander's life. It's a naive question, but worth asking, Katrin, is why would they want to assassinate uh, the Tsar, who, the first of the Tsars, had begun to put in reforms and begun to change society in the general direction, uh, although and obviously not as radically as, but in the general direction in which they approved? Well, I think the, I mean, my understanding would be that the sort of, as it were, contempt for the reform process and, and a sort of sense that you can't, you can't work it like that, that you have to fundamentally change, change things and, um, as it were, work, work from the bottom up. I mean, you're talking about a process of reform at the highest levels and they, that they want um, interaction with, with, the, with the population and essentially, above all, as I understand it, land reform. I mean, a land reform on a much broader scale. I mean, it's essentially what... Um, can't be termed nationalisation of land, but um, cessation of the land, make, making over the land to the, to the people through the village commune. Um, that was certainly the aim of the, the movement that the people's will came out of. Um, uh, Dominic, the... Land uh, the people. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Do, did I interrupt you? I did interrupt you. Do you want to finish? No, I just uh, added the words land, land and people. That's yes. Awesome. Dominic, uh, what, so the Alexander II is assassinated. Um, um, in, uh, in, uh, in 1881. What was the immediate effect of his assassination? Well, the immediate effect was his replacement by his son, Alexander III. And, of course, the assassination of his father reinforced the message which had been coming from the sort of conservative ends of the elite, of the bureaucracy, and parts of the aristocracy, that this is what happens when you reform. You give people all sorts of ideas, they begin expecting... Uh, far more radical reforms than the you know than one could ever hope to provide, and reforms which will blow Russia apart. You do have to remember that Nicholas the First's regime was That's one Alexander's of the most father. Yes, yes. The, the regime of his father, who died in 1855, was one of the most conservative in Europe. Within six years of Nicholas being dead, you've got a small but nevertheless influential element of the educated class calling not just for the overthrow of the monarchy, but also private property and marriage. Uh, this is a rather <laughs> radical line to take in Victorian Europe. It's not altogether unlike Gorbachev coming to power in 1985, Soviet Union and international communism being dead six years later. Um, from the Conservative perspective, it just proves that in this kind of state and society, if you take the brakes off, all hell gets uh, released. And that is how they interpreted the assassination. So we've had, had the, as it were, from Dominic the conservative reaction because Alexander in his reform seemed to manage to alienate both the reactionaries and the radicals. But what, what was the reaction of, reaction of the other radicals to this assassination, Orlando? Um, uh, you, you mean within the revolutionary yeah. movement? Yeah, within that broad yeah. movement. Of well, I think the assassination, in a sense, just um, ac accentuated the dilemma that had confronted the, op the revolutionary opposition from the beginning, which is... Do you go through social revolution or do you go through political revolution? Um, and the assassination was a desperate attempt uh, to deal with that problem uh, from the point of view that, you know, we cannot uh, organise a social revolution while we have this overbearing autocracy uh, 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 um, stopping our every movement. Uh, we have to uh, eradicate the state structure of oppression before we can organise ourselves. So revolutionary dictatorship becomes the trigger to social revolution, which is essentially, from that point on, still the model for, the, I would say, the dominant form of the Russian revolutionary tradition, which eventually comes out in Bolshevism. So we have the right-wing reaction, as it were, and the, the, from Dominic, the, as it were, if we can use these terms, which are slightly helpful left. What about the cultural uh, consequences, Katriana Kelly? Well, it's in terms of the precise figures we were talking about um, in regard to the 1860s, 1870s, it's slightly difficult to say because Turgenev died in 1883, so there's not much, much time for him left, Dostoevsky in 1881. With Tolstoy, it appears to lead long-term to radicalisation in him as well because, I mean, if one compares the Tolstoy of War and Peace, who's very much on the side of the landowners, with the Tolstoy of the 1890s, who's um, quite a radical populist in many ways and believes in making over the land to the peasantry, you see as he's, he's gone through a, a sort of evolution, you could say, rudely belatedly, if you like, um, which approaches that of the, uh, the liberal gentry class in general. Um, 
so he's a kind of example of movement, I mean, sort of strong political movement, um, and in time also creates a, a popular movement. He has a great deal of, fo- for, of uh, followers, um, so many indeed that he's still considered a threat in the Soviet period. Um, so, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's an example. As far as sort of literature and culture goes generally, though, I mean, I wouldn't see 1881 as a really all that important a break. I mean... It's a strange thing, but I mean, the paradox is that, for example, in the theatre, in 1882, um, Alexander III's government um, ends the monopoly of the imperial theatres in uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg, which had formerly made it very difficult to stage plays outside the imperial theatres. I mean, um, the result is a very vibrant private theatre culture in the late 1880s, um, 1890s, which is far more exciting than anything that had gone on before that. And the, the irony is that traditionally the theatre had been something of which the Tsarist regime was very afraid because it meant a public assembly. It meant something that had sort of saucy connotations, possibly, that I mean, it wasn't very easy to police, that might be considered inflammatory. And so it's a very strange thing that you get this apparently very repressive regime which, which makes this, this change. It does, does, doesn't add up, and I think in many ways the cultural situation in, in other respects doesn't add up either. But you still have increased uh, censorship after 1881. And I think you have, as a result, a retreat from what one might call the civic populism of most of the arts and literature in the 1860s and 70s. So you have a retreat from political engagement, I think, in in most of the arts after the 1880s. Yes, but, I mean, on the other hand, they move into a full-scale decadent movement by the late 1880s, early 1890s, which is hardly... Mm. One, one, could, one could say, I mean, in terms of issues of personal autonomy, it looks like liberalisation. Yes. Um, if not in issues yes. of, sort of social commitment. Do you think, uh, Orlando, that there's any, uh, there's a direct line from the assassination of Alexander II in 1881 to the Bolsheviks coming uh, to power? Do you think that, it, to put it bluntly, that this was an end of an attempt to reform and the beginning of the necessity, in inverted commas, as they might see it, the radicals, for revolution? It was that big a turning point. Well, without wanting to be too deterministic, I'd say yes, probably, on, on two grounds. Firstly, that, as, as Dominic says, uh, political reform uh, was now shelved and neither of the last two Tsars, Alexander III nor Nicholas II, really was a reformist in any sense. Nicholas II obviously made some concessions when he was threatened with losing his throne in 1905, but they were short-lived concessions. Um, so the sort of autocratic principle was strengthened and representative government and forms of the, of the Ziemstvers and, and municipal government were, were rolled back. Um, and I would say yes also on the grounds that the uh, example of the people's will, Narodna Volia, was, it was the prototype of the Bolshevik party. Um, and uh, because of the intensification of of autocratic power after 1881, uh, social ref- social revolution was just always, I think, on the back foot from that point. Um, yes, Menschism is in that tradition. Yes, there's neo-populism, which is in that tradition. But essentially, um, uh, when you look at the history of Marxism in Russia, at every point where they have to choose between social revolution or political putschism, they take the political high road. Um, And so the conspiratorial party uh, becomes the the model of Russian revolutionary organisation leading up right to 1917. Dominic, what's that? Yes, I don't altogether disagree with that. Um, I think the key in 1881 is that Alexander II, the the assassinated Tsar, had been persuaded that to stabilise the regime you needed to win back the support or hold the support of broad sections of educated public opinion. After he's murdered, his son decides that you can crush the revolutionary movement through a more effective police regime. And in the short run, he's right. They succeed. But it does result, longer term, in the regime increasingly losing support in educated society, partly because it stomps on the civil rights of ordinary educated citizens. Having said all of that, I'm not myself a great optimist about the chances of regime... Uh, and civil society working together to bring 20th century Russia into some liberal or liberal democratic era. Partly, I just think, because essentially what one's dealing with in the early 80s is still the politics of notables, of a very narrow section of society, really. The big challenge comes, not just in Russia, but everywhere in Europe, when you get onto mass politics with mass literacy, working class, increasingly educated peasantry. 
And uh, rather sadly, I mean, the truth is that virtually everywhere in the periphery of Europe, whether you're talking about Spain, Portugal, Italy, Hungary, the Balkans, everywhere, actually liberalism collapses uh, and you get various forms of nasty authoritarian regime, either of the right or of the left, usually of the right. But it's um, a, it's all, I, it might be a, a, but it's a, it perhaps an interesting distinction between uh, not to say, well, no, this would not have led to a uh, liberal democratic state mm. in the early 20th century, but it would have prevented a revolution... Uh, of the sort and of the virulence which became uh, the revolution of the early 20th century. That is also, that it's, a, it's, it's also a question. It's conceivable. Mm. Mm. It's conceivable. I don't myself think it probably would have done, but, you know, once one begins going in for counterfactuals, mm. there are mm. endless, endless things to be said. I, look, I agree with Orlando. It seems to me that there is no doubt that uh, what happened in 1881 did stop... Alexander II's policy of trying to reconcile the Tsarist state with um, educated society and its more moderate liberal elements. And that, in the long run, certainly contributed to the illegitimacy of the regime and to its collapse. Metternich, uh, Orlando, you know this better now, the Austrian statesman Prince Metternich once said that the most dangerous moment for a state is when it reforms. Mm. Do you think that's, that's what we've got here? Absolutely. And I think Alexander is like all... Russian reformers in that sense that he's effectively making it up as he goes along without a real strategy or plan and he can't stop social processes running ahead of his political reforms so that uh, in fact his grip on society loosens as he reforms and in that sense he's similar to Stolypin, another great reformer although um, I think doomed uh, in the 1900s and indeed Gorbachev um, who Dominic has already compared Alexander to. This is the problem. How do you reform and stabilise the society on the basis of the rule of law and property ultimately um, in a social crisis where uh, revolutionary forces are constantly kicking against. And in um, a political system whose entire historical logic is authoritarian and centralist, mm. now you're bringing in Western liberal principles. It's not necessarily very easy to match the two. Final word? And, I mean, something we haven't talked about at all, which is the broadening of education. So on the one hand, you need education because you've got to get workers who are skilled in the factories. On the other hand, education destabilises the system because then people have got access to all these dangerous books that before you've been able to publish knowing that they'd have an audience of 2,000. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Katrina Kelly, uh, Don McLevine, Orlando Figes, uh, and thank you for listening. Next week, we'll be talking about the mind and body problem. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.